Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPad and iPhone, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. And by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is a talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, there are times that it feels like the Take Control authors are writing books just for me because they keep authoring books of programs I either like or love. Not, not just the ones I can use, but the ones I really like or love. This time, we're going to talk about Take Control of Keynote, a brand new book by Mr. Joe Kissel. Joe, welcome back. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me again. It's good to see you as always. And I'm so glad that you wrote this book because I want everybody to enjoy t uh, Keynote as much as I do. And now with Take Control of Keynote, I think there's a much better chance that they will. Keynote's a great program. And um, I, I use it quite a bit. I'm very fond of it. And uh, we already had books on pages and numbers, so we need to complete the trilogy. And uh, since, since Keynote is a program that I, that I use and like a lot, I was very happy to be able to contribute that. The great thing about Keynote, Joe, I think, is that it's, it's, it's so accessible. It's, it's unlike that other presentation program that we shall not name, um, which reportedly has gotten better in its latest version. It, it, it has. Uh, there, uh, PowerPoints, it, it's, it's, it's a good program. Um, and of course, it's what most of the world uses. People say, you know, I'm going to make a PowerPoint about this, that like they use PowerPoint as even as a verb sometimes. Um, but they don't say it like, I'm going to make a PowerPoint slideshow. They say, I'm just going to make a PowerPoint, just like PowerPoint is the noun. Um, and it has gotten better. Uh, the the iOS version is quite nice, um, and the the Office 2016 version is is certainly uh, a significant improvement over what came before. So I have no problem with PowerPoint, but I like Keynote better. <laughs> um, it's partly a matter of style. It's partly a matter of kind of you know Keynote is what the cool kids use. Um, PowerPoint, you know, PowerPoint is a really like serious business oriented kind of thing. And it can do fun things too, but Keynote is an Apple product, so it's more relaxed and it's, as you say, it's more accessible. And um, it's it's something that it's a lot easier to just dive in and have fun with. So um, I, I can I can use either one. They're both fine, really. I, I don't have, I have hardly anything bad to say about PowerPoint. It's just a, a matter of, of style and personal preference. I think Keynote's pretty awesome. The, the one thing about PowerPoint, and unless it's changed in this new version, and I confess I've not used the new version, it always has that look, that PowerPoint look where the bullets, and, and I think it may be because of people not designing it properly. They use the stock bullets. They use everything right out of the box, and they think it's, it's fantastic. And inevitably, it just has that look. And as soon as I see that look, part of my brain tunes out. I get you. I get you. Uh, the new PowerPoint does have um, new uh, themes. That PowerPoint doesn't call them themes. What do they call them? Any theme. What? I, I'm so I, I switch back and forth between the programs. And I, I <laughs> the two, you know, like templates. You know, they they use different terminology because Keynote has themes, and I guess PowerPoint has templates. Anyway, they have new ones. There, uh, uh, some of them are quite pretty. Um, but then again, you can always open up an old presentation you did 10 years ago and modify that. So it's, so it's still going to look as ugly as it used to, <laughs> you know, PowerPoint, um, PowerPoint was born in an era when, uh, a slideshow was just bullets on a slide, you know? And of course, a lot of people do presentations that way. I think it's pretty boring. In my book, I really encourage you not to just put bullets on a slide, um, and I especially encourage you not to read off of your slides. Um, I have a whole chapter on like sort of developing your presentation, thinking about it before you actually start putting stuff on your slides and the different forms of presentations. And granted, there are some situations, uh, there's nothing wrong with bullets per se, um, there are some situations in which you really need bullets. There are some situations in which you really need to have a lot of text on your slides. But for most people, if you're 
if you're trying to motivate an audience or inspire an audience or or teach them something, keep their attention, just, you know, a lot of text on the screen is boring. And reading text off the screen is, is even worse because everybody in your audience is going to be thinking, why did you have to be here? I can read. Why didn't you just give me this thing to read? If there's a purpose for you being on the stage or in front of the classroom or whatever, um, that, that should be to convey things that you can't put on slides. So I talk a lot in the book about the, the sort of essence of creating good presentations uh, beyond just the, the mechanics of it. That sort of jumps to a question I was going to do a lot, a lot later, a lot farther down the road. The idea that, that there's something about most people that use Keynote, and, and I'm uh, generalization, yes, but most people that use Keynote seems to take an interest in the the craft of creating presentations as opposed to just taking whatever it is, slapping it up there in bullet points, and then standing up in front of an audience, and like you say, a lot of the time reading it. Those are both gross characterizations, folks. I know that, so no no emails, please. But you you do include some tips about some of the craft of creating a presentation, and I love that. Yeah, you know, th this is uh, I my my goal was to make this book 150 pages long. It turned out more like 170, which is much much shorter than the books on uh, numbers and pages. I could have easily added another 100 200 pages. Um, there are lots, lots more things to say. Um, th th there's only so much I can do in a book this length to teach you sort of, you know, presentation techniques. Um, and even though I have like certain things I've used in some of my presentations that work well, every situation is different. You know, one, you know, cool animation or chart or something that works great for me in this situation just might not apply to something else. But uh, I do certainly uh, encourage readers to think about your audience, think about what their expectations are, think about what their needs are, think about how you can best convey information, and uh, you know, can consider whether you might even want, to, like, you know, I, I think the best presentations, frankly, are the ones that, that you give when the power goes out. Like, you know, if you've heard a great sermon or a great political speech or something where it was just all the speaker, you know, there weren't any visuals and you were just, you know, hooked, you were just um, engrossed in this talk because the words were so great. Um, I think that's what every speaker, every presenter should strive for. Sometimes you need to show people things that you can't explain in words. I mean, you I can't, I can't explain a screenshot to you very well. I can't explain a photograph to you or a, you know, a table. It just wouldn't come out as well. And sometimes visuals really help support and emphasize uh, what you're saying. But in most cases, I think you, you really need to start with what it is you want to say. And once you figure that out, then figure out what the visuals are that support and elaborate on that and, and help you to tell your story better. So, so we, we've talked a lot about the presentation and, and the thinking behind it, but I'm curious, how, how did you go about taking something? Because a lot of us think of Keynote as, as so approachable that most things are pretty easy. The other thing, of course, that's happened in Keynote's recent history is it went to a new version and it was completely rewritten. And so some people see it taking a step back as being quite as fully featured. So how do you how do you guide us into this brave new world of the of the newest version of Keynote and maybe for the rank beginner who hasn't picked it up before? Yeah, the the newer version of Keynote compared to the older version um it is different. Um a lot of things it looks simpler and there's a temptation to say, "Oh, well they they must have removed all these features." In fact, they removed very few features, but they did move things around so that uh, a lot of the features are there, but you have to dig a little bit for them. They're not in your face. And part of this was a really deliberate decision on Apple's part to reduce screen clutter because the old Keynote had like pallets everywhere. And you're always having to slide things out of the way to see, you know, your, your slides or, or whatever thing you're working on. And there's just all these little windowlets. 
Um, there are very few of those in the new keynote. Most of what you need to do, you can do all in a single window, and you have this inspector on the side that is context sensitive. So it it changes based on what you have selected. You have a certain set of controls if you select a text, different controls if you've selected a graphic, and so on. Um, I, I will say one feature that that we lost that I'm very sad about um, has to do with master slides. So master slides are, are fantastic. Uh, they, they let you say, you know, th this is what I want all of my, um, you know, title and bullet slides to look like. And so you set fonts and sizes and colors and backgrounds, and like all those attributes. And then you just, anytime you have a slide with that general shape, you apply that master and you're done. And then if you want to change something on all those slides at once, you just change the master. So that's really cool. Um, used to be, that one of the things you could specify for your master slides was transitions and builds. So for example, uh, every time I display a bullet list slide, just because that's an easy thing to, to say, uh, I want to use the cube animation. So you could build that in, but now even if you have 100 slides in your presentation, you want them all to use the same transition, you have to add it to every single one manually. And if you have, if you want all of your bullet lists to build one bullet at a time as you click, of course you can do that. But again, you can't build that into the master slides like you used to be able to do. So that's that makes me sad. But of of the things that are lost, that's really the only one I personally care about. And I and overall, although it took me a little bit of time to get used to it, I, I quite like the new keynote. I think it's uh, it's well designed, and um, it's. The thing is, it's deceptively simple. You look at it and you think, well, there's really not that much here. There aren't that many features. But then you start digging. So here's something I learned that I did not realize because, because okay, tables and charts. So you can put a table or a chart in Keynote. Great. Like, I hardly ever use tables or charts. Once in a blue moon, I'll use a table or a chart. That's just not the sort of presentation I usually uh, make. But um, what I discovered while working on this book was that the tables and charts in Keynote have something like 90% of the features of numbers. You can do almost anything you can do in numbers in Keynote. All the calculations, all the formulas and functions, like all that stuff, the 3D charts, like everything you can do in numbers, you can do in Keynote too. There are a few things like, you know, numbers gives you a larger like workspace and uh, it has like more import and export options and you can do things like transposing columns and rows and, and you know, there are a few things, but, but basically it, if I just wanted to use Keynote for all of my spreadsheet needs, I totally could, um, which is a little bit mind blowing. So when you get to the chapter of my book that talks about um, tables and charts, I'm like, well, you know, the numbers book was like 300 pages long. I'm not going to make this chapter 300 pages long. I'm going to give you the basics here. Um, if you want to know all the details, go read, you know, Sharon's numbers book. But that's just an example of how incredibly deep and complex Keynote really is. Apple has done a very good job of hiding a lot of the complexity but it's there, and the tools are available if you want to use them and, and are, are willing to, uh, to figure out where they are and, and how to get at them. It's, it's really incredibly powerful. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Today, I want to tell you about PDF Pen Scan Plus from Smile, the app that turns your iOS device into a document scanner. Sure, you could just take a photo of your documents, but using PDF Pen Scan Plus does so much more. First, it captures your document. Second, it turns it into a PDF, a format that's much more versatile than just a graphics file. Third, if you wish, it will run optical character recognition, usually referred to as OCR, on your document, turning it into a searchable PDF document so that you can find exactly what you're looking for the next time you pull that document up on your iDevice or even your Mac. And speaking of your Mac, 
PDF Pen Scan Plus also lets you auto export your documents to Dropbox and iCloud so your documents are available everywhere you need them. Or you can just store them in your iPhone or your iPad. Your choice. PDF Pen Scan Plus also lets you import and export documents from Evernote, Transporter, and Google Drive cloud services, import scans from your iPhoto library, organize your documents in folders. The list of features just goes on and on. You can get PDF Pen Scan Plus in the iTunes App Store right now for just $6.99. Get it now and make your iPhone or iPad an even more powerful tool for organization and productivity. While you're at it, visit SmileSoftware.com to download demo versions of Smile's PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro for your Mac and learn more about Smile's PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, the perfect companions to PDF Pen Scan Plus. Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for being the longest-running sponsor of Mac Voices. I wish I'd had this book a few months ago because earlier this year I put together a, a major presentation at the office and there was such a temptation to go back and use the old version of Keynote because I know every, every, where everything is and I can whip it together. And I thought, no, I you know I really got to bite the bullet, move ahead because there's some new features that I and new transitions and all that I would like to incorporate. And the more I worked with it, I have to say the more I, I liked it. In fact, I think the more I started to prefer it over the old version of Keynote. Because of what you said, the, the palettes, they, they all stay in one place. Yeah, you have to learn how to navigate around and where certain things are. But once you do that, I think it's faster. And I, I was I was very pleased with the results as they turned out because I, I didn't feel – I never once at the end of the day felt like I wish I'd had that, you know, from the old version. Right. I, I was right. – you know, I, there were a couple times during the creation that I didn't think I was going to be able to do it, so I had to find out how to do it now. But once I did, yeah, it, it was – I won't tell you it was 100 percent parody, but it wasn't anything I missed. Yeah, well, you know, there there are some artists, some graphic artists who have done just these incredible – uh, animations in Keynote. So they're using Keynote not as a presentation tool, but as as an animation program. And I, I have links to a couple of examples in the book. And they they like, you know, put some presentation, you know, they, they put them have a soundtrack. So there's music and then they have animations that are just doing crazy things. And you're like, what kind of wacky animation software are they using? But you can actually download these things and see for yourself exactly how they made all of these transitions and shapes and just crazy stuff happen. Um, and I find those really inspiring. I find I find it um, wonderful that um, you can. There, there is a learning curve, yes, but once once you get over that, uh, if if you're willing to play a bit, you can do some some really impressive stuff. Yeah, it, Magic Move is your friend. It's <laughs> Magic Move is awesome. It's possible to overdo it, but if if you use it just like you would tastefully with fonts, um, you can do some really, like you say, amazing things that enhance the presentation. Not just the whiz bang stuff where, oh, it went from there to there, and I didn't, you know, how how did he do that? But really enhance the the, the things you're trying to highlight the the message you're trying to get across. Let's talk about Magic Move for a minute. Okay. So for, uh, for listeners or viewers who don't know, Magic Move is a transition. It's a, way, a, visual, um, a visual way of getting from one slide to the next. And instead of like, you know, one slide disappears and the next one appears, um, in Magic Move, um, you, you start with two slides. The, the, the easiest way to do it is you, you, you start with a slide. You put stuff on it, text, graphics, shapes, whatever you want. Then you duplicate that, and you, you make changes to it. You move things around, you delete things, add things, change fonts, change colors, resize, whatever. You, you change stuff, and then you just say, magic move. You, you, just, you, just, you just turn it on. And then as you're playing it, um, the, the first slide has its stuff on it, and uh, then all the stuff moves into the new locations and it's not just that things move around but fonts can change and so like you have a, a block of text in a certain font on one slide and a different font on the other slide it smoothly morphs the whole shape of the font morphs in real time and so you can you can do this with like you know something starts out as a circle and it ends up 
as an oval oh, and also it moves down here and also it flips and also it you know changes color like all these things can happen and you don't have to do any programming you just say magic move and it works and um the i i didn't realize until i started you know experimenting how many different kinds of things magic move can do and they're really cool and it's such an easy way to to get what the, the effect is like you haven't actually changed slides you just had some stuff on the screen and now it moves now you have different stuff on the screen and now it moves again and you have some different stuff on the screen so it can help you make a presentation a lot more seamless you don't have to have just next slide next slide next slide you you have a a flow and i think that's that's very kind to your audience it it keeps them engaged and it also helps to sort of emphasize the continuity of what you're saying so it's magic move is is really great this edition of mac voices is sponsored by lynda.com the unparalleled online video training library get a full free 10-day trial at lynda.com slash mac voices if you're a Mac Voices listener or viewer, it's a pretty safe bet that we share some characteristics. You like to learn, to keep up with what's new and interesting in the tech field and beyond. That you are tech savvy to one degree or another. That you want to be more productive and probably need to be more productive, either for yourself or for your vocation. We all have our secret weapons to keep us afloat and ahead of the competition. I'm happy to say that lynda.com is a key piece of my arsenal. No one can learn everything about everything, no matter how hard we try, because tomorrow, next week, or next month, there's even more of everything. If I can learn something from an expert, why would I want to waste precious time trying to figure it out for myself? Lynda.com has experts in a wide variety of subjects, tech and non-tech, who will help you learn what you need to learn fast and efficiently, and at your own pace. Say that you need to get up to speed on Google Apps for the office, or want to learn how to work with Camera Raw in Photoshop Creative Cloud or are interested in learning about entrepreneurship from someone like the one and only Guy Kawasaki. Those are just a few of the recent courses that lynda.com has published. And I mean just a few, because there are all sorts of videos to help you learn about the general concepts of a topic, or the down and dirty details. You can try all of this for a free full 10 days by signing up at lynda.com slash macvoices. During that 10 days, you can watch whatever you want, as much as you want, on any subject you want. No restrictions, no limitations. Try a design course, then a spreadsheet course, then a web publishing course. You pick the topics that suit you, not some limited subset of the collection of over 3,500 courses on lynda.com. Please, do something nice for yourself right now by signing up for 10 days free at lynda.com slash macvoices. Then let me know what you decided to watch. Maybe we can trade recommendations. I'm on Twitter as at Chuck Joyner, and I want to hear from you. One last time, lynda.com slash macvoices for a free 10-day trial. Do it now, you won't regret it. Thanks to lynda.com for their support of Mac Voices. What else, Joe, did you find? Because it, it's, it's a challenge taking a program like this that you probably knew so well, I think, in stepping back to stage one and saying, okay, I've got to look at this like someone who's opening it for the first time. Or someone who's been steeped in PowerPoint, and now there's this this strange thing called Keynote that they they want to learn or need to learn. Well, you know, my own use of Keynote has been almost exclusively when I'm giving a presentation in front of in front of a live audience. You know, I'm I'm going to a Mac user group, for example, uh, or I'm speaking at MacWorld or on a cruise or whatever, and. So I have my things I want to tell you. I'm telling you about backing up your Mac, or I'm talking about online privacy or passwords or whatever, and so I have my visuals to support that. Um, but apart from like using Keynote for just cool, fun animations, um, I, I started realizing how many other things people use Keynote for. So for example, um, people, uh, people who want to make something instructional, whether it's, you know, uh, hey, you're at a museum and there's a kiosk with an iPad or a Mac on it, and that's running just in this loop. This prep, maybe it's maybe it's a static presentation, just keeps going on in the loop. That's telling you about this exhibit, or maybe it's interactive. You can do something in Keynote that is almost like HyperCard. So you 
you can link from one slide to another or from a slide to a web page or from other things um, by making any shape or any uh, graphic or, or any text into a link. So you can have, you know, like, oh, tell me more about this. And somebody, you know, clicks on something or, or uses a touch screen and that moves them around, you know, sort of hypertext uh, presentation um, in Keynote. Um, so people are using them, are using Keynote to make instructional materials and um, things that will play on, on kiosks and uh, things where um, uh, it, it's not even interactive, where I, I, but where I just want to say, okay, um, I can't be there in person to deliver this presentation. Maybe this is something I'm going to put on the web. I'm just going to save it as a movie and put it on YouTube. Or maybe I'm going to send it to somebody else because I'm going to be out of town and whatever, and somebody else needs to give this presentation. So basically, you, you put Keynote into a record mode, and you go through, you, you, you click whenever you want your builds and transitions to occur, and you have a microphone, so you're, you're narrating it as you go. And you save the whole thing, and then when you play it back, you get all of that. You get your voice narrating it, and and the slides, and the and the different uh, animations and so forth happening just the way you wanted them to. And you can package that however you want. You can just send it as a keynote file or as a movie or, or whatever. Um, and so those are just a few examples, but there are lots of different ways that people use Keynote that aren't the conventional presentation, like, you know, like a, a TED Talk or something where I'm going to give a 15-minute talk and there are slides behind me and that's it. Um, so I, I try to, um, to just think through some of these different use cases, and I found it really eye-opening. It's like, oh, well, it never occurred to me that I could do that. But now that I've seen that Keynote has this feature, now I really want to make a presentation that does this sort of thing or does that sort of thing because, because now, I, now I realize that I can. Like we've all seen screencasts where somebody is, uh, you know, they record their screen and they're doing stuff, they're demonstrating a soft, some sort of software, and you can hear their voice and you can see the pointer move. Um, so, uh, you know, recorded presentations are kind of like that instead of uh, looking at Windows, though, or, you know, your email program or whatever's on your screen, you're looking at the things that you have custom designed in Keynote. So it's really great for, for um, teaching, for demonstrating things, um, and there there's just so many different ways to have fun with it. So um, I, the, the more, honestly, the more I wrote about Keynote and the more examples I found of the ways people used it, the more I wanted to use it. And we're like, okay, I need an excuse to do this now. <laughs> like somebody, somebody booked me for a talk so that I can do this thing because that's really cool. Yeah. That's, that's the effect Keynote has on you. I think that as you work through it, you, you want to play, you want to use it as, as a tool. You look for reasons, as you said, uh, to, to experiment with it as opposed to some other programs. And I'm, I'm talking now just in general where you think, okay, that's the best tool for the job. And that's what I'll use. But here I'm looking for things that I can apply Keynote to. Right. Um, this may be a little bit toward the advanced user or maybe the novice user who's just getting started with this version. How has, how has Apple improved or changed the audio uh, recording and, and audio parts of Keynote? Because that was one of the things that was kind of lacking before. If you wanted precise audio timing, you pretty much had to take it into iMovie or better yet, Final Cut. Do we have an improvement in there? Well, <laughs> it's a little bit better. I mean, audio takes a couple of forms. There's a recording, which I just talked about. Um, and then there's adding a soundtrack. So you can have as many different songs or sound effects or whatever um, play just, you know, constantly through your presentation. Uh, of course, you can add sounds, isolated sounds to particular slides. The, the problem with recordings is that the, the editing capabilities are pretty limited. So if you make a mistake, you can stop it, back up, and start again. And even if you go through the whole thing and you realize, oh, you know, from minute 12 on, um, there are issues, you go back to minute 12 and then start at minute 12 and then you know, edit from there on in, but that's it. You you can't you can't just say, okay, this thirty minute presentation was great except for minute four, so I just want to go back in there and fix minute four because my timings are wrong or I flubbed what I said or whatever. That unfortunately you can't do, um, and that made me a little sad. Um, 
uh, oh, by the way, remind me to tell you <laughs> to tell you something else that makes me sad about remote presentations. Um, but um, but even so, you know, one of the things I say uh, if you're giving a live presentation is you have to practice. You're, you're not going to be reading your slides. You really shouldn't do that. Um, know what you're going to do and practice and get it right so that you can do it smoothly uh, without much of a, a crutch. And that, the same thing applies to recordings. Um, you, you don't just expect to, to go through it and get it all perfect on your first shot. Um, practice it first and it'll probably be okay. Yeah. And I didn't mean to point out a, a shortcoming. It's just that I know that's something that I, at times you'd like to do. And, and this a presentation tool is really not built for that. I mean, maybe eventually it'll meld with, you know, one of the others. But for now... I, I will say, um, so, so you've finished your recorded presentation. You're like, okay, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to export this as a movie because I want to put it on YouTube or something. You can do that, but the results will probably suck um, because uh, what a lot of people have found when they export a presentation, a recorded presentation as a movie, is that it, it stutters and you have sync problems between your audio and, and the slides. So um, what, what a lot of people do is they use screen recording software like screen, uh, ScreenFlow. So they, they just say, okay, ScreenFlow, start recording now, and then play their presentation and let ScreenFlow do the recording for them. And there are, there are other programs that do the same thing. Um, that's, that's a bit of a, that's a ding. I mean, you know, that Apple should really get the exporting right. But at least there's a reasonably okay workaround for it. Um, and of course, you know, I, I point out these flaws in the book. Um, I, I'm, I, and whether, when there's a workaround, I tell you what the workaround is. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like a keynote fanboy. Like there are things that aren't great. The, the thing I was, I was alluding to before is, um, a lot of times I will give remote presentations. So, uh, a user group, uh, will say, you know, we're in Maine or, you know, wherever, Florida. And as much as we'd like to, you know, fly you out here to give a presentation in person, we don't have the budget for it. So how about if you give a remote presentation and we'll get everybody in a room and put, uh, put you on the projector and uh, you can come in remotely and, and give your presentation. So I do that a lot. And it used to be that I would use messages or before that iChat to do this. And messages was great because I could, I could put my keynote presentation into messages and so you'd have my presentation up here and I could control it in real time. I could see it on my screen, but I could also see the audience and they could see a little picture of me down here and they could see my presentation up here. So Apple took that feature out of messages in Mavericks, which made me really unhappy. And there are other ways to get approximately that same effect, but none that are as good. So uh, one of the ways to do it is to use Skype. You can also use Google Hangouts. There are some other ways, but they all have certain drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks, if you use something like Skype, is that you can't see your audience. So if I say, all right, I'm going to play my keynote presentation now, audience. Uh, I'm going to you know, share my screen. Even if I have two screens, I'm going to share one of my screens. I'm going to play my presentation. I'm going to keep talking and walk you through my presentation. The audience will still be able to see my picture down, down in, in the corner, but I won't be able to see them because wh when you play a presentation in Keynote, um, it, it takes over your entire screen. And um, it even if you have two screens, it blacks out the other. Or like it'll, it'll use one as a presenter display or it'll black it out. There's no way to show another app like Skype while Keynote is playing your presentation. PowerPoint doesn't have that problem. PowerPoint lets you play your entire presentation in a window. So then you can say, well, I'm just going to share this window in Skype or whatever, rather than share the entire screen. I'll just share the window. That way I can still see other stuff on my screen, including my audience. And the people on the other end won't know the difference. So I would, I would really like, you know, if Apple is going to take theater out of messages, the least they could do is give us a, you know, view my presentation in a window mode so that I can work around it. And they haven't done that. And that makes me unhappy. But, you know, I'm unhappy about a lot of things and, and, <laughs> Well, and, and we've seen this a number of times now with Apple, where they rewrite apps from the ground up, 
And the first release is not, doesn't even come close to having parity with the one that it's replacing. And then, you know, things change and they make additional improvements and they bring some of the features back. So it, it I, could I, happen. I think we can be hopeful. And especially if people express that much of an interest. Um, I just want, I, given the audience for Keynote, I wonder how much of a, of a priority that would be. Well, that's the thing. I, I suspect it's pretty low. Um, but yeah, you do what you can. You yep. do what you can. What 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 other things? To, maybe maybe the best way to say it is other, of course, the magic move. We talked about that. What are some of the favorite new things for you in Keynote? Styles. Mm. So, um, in in as an author, I use styles all the time. So you're writing a book, and you have a style for headings, and a style for bullets, and a style for you know, smaller and smaller and smaller headings and a style for captions and like any, any different kind of like paragraph shape you have a style for and any kind of, um, like I have a style for, um, block quotes and a style for, you know, any, any different kind of, um, way your text needs to be styled either at the character level or at the list level or the paragraph level. Um, and what's great about styles, if you are a, a writer or, you know, you, you make books or, or, or things like that, is that you can decide, you know what, I really think all the heading twos should be a little bit smaller. So you, you make a change to the definition of the style once, and then all the heading twos in your document are smaller. You want to change the, the font, change the color, change whatever, you change it once in the style, and then it changes everywhere. Um, so... I, 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 I am hugely dependent upon styles in my writing. The old version of Keynote didn't have uh, anywhere near the capabilities uh, for styles as, as the new Keynote does. In fact, it, arguably, it, it almost overdoes it. I mean, so you have styles for characters, paragraphs, lists, uh, shapes, images, um, Oh my goodness! There, there are like a few others that I, I don't have in front of me. So, um, but but they're like any different kind of object that you can think of in in Keynote. Almost almost any object um, you can you can create a style for. So styles might you know for text it would include like what is the font and size and color. Um, for a list, it might include, is this a bulleted list or a numbered list? What kind of bullet character do I have? How big is the indent? For a paragraph, it might include, is it justified? Is it right aligned? What's the you know line spacing? For uh, an image or a shape, well, you know, it might include, is there is there a, a drop shadow or a reflection? Um, for a shape, it might be like you know, a line. Um, it might be how thick is the line? Is there is the, you know do we have borders and fills and colors and gradients and all these different kinds of things? So uh, using using a shape as an example, maybe you have you need to have squares and circles and stars and things on your on your slides, um, and none of the default styles are to your liking. You really need to have all of the all of the um, the strokes, the outline, the borders be you know four points bright green and you really need to have all the fills be you know a very particular shade of deep purple and um you really need them to all have a drop shadow with certain specifications you you you, you do that you, with one and you say make a style now every time i uh create a graphic with that style um, it'll have all those attributes, and if I later decide, yeah, I really don't like the drop shadow after all, you take it out of the style, and then that takes it out of all those objects that use it. So, um, in a way, this sort of makes up for the lack of um, of builds on master slides. It, it, it's sort of the same thing. It's it's just as master slides say, you know, all all the slides of this type are going to have these attributes. Styles say all of the objects of this kind, all of the text boxes or all of the paragraphs or all of the stars or whatever it may be, have these attributes. And so you can change them uh, once and then have that change propagate everywhere in your presentation. That's really, really nice. That's, that's quite cool. So it's, it's not exactly a master slide kind of control, but it's something similar? Well, uh, master slides... Um, 
master slides sort of give you a, a starting point. So they give you what's on the background and, and which, which sort of placeholders exist by default. Of course, you can change all this stuff later, but like, let's say, let's say I, have a, I want to have a logo on all of my slides and the entire presentation. Well, I'll just put that logo on each of the master slides that I use, and then I'm done. It just, it'll be there for everything. Um, whereas styles are, um, are sort of the next, the next level down. So um, styles apply to a certain type of object, whether it's on a master slide or whether it's just manually added. It's, it's everywhere. So master slides um, serve one purpose and, and styles ser serve another, but they're, they're, they're related in the sense that they, they both give you ways to define something in one place and have it apply in multiple places. Um, and in fact, um, for, for those who are used to styles in pages, um, just as the tables and charts in Keynote are, are, are basically the same as, as everything in numbers, the styles, the text stuff in, uh, in Keynote is basically the same as what Pages gives you. So if you're familiar with paragraph and list and, and uh, character styles in Pages, uh, Keynote gives you very much the same thing. Joe, we could go on for a long time because there's so there's so much power in Keynote. There's so much that's fun to play with. There's and and, and don't misunderstand, folks. This is not a toy. We we talk about it being fun just because it lets you be creative without having to have the the manual dexterity of, of being creative. Um, but I, I so I would definitely encourage folks to go try Keynote out. It's free because it's on your Mac right now. Joe's book will help you get more out of it, you know, if you need hand, your hand held to get started, or it'll also give you a lot more if you're an advanced user about some of the new things and some of the cool things that you can do when you when you look at some of the animations he talked about and different things. I know uh, some of them I stumbled upon, some I had to go and look up. Joe, what are the specifics on the book as far as price and, and all the, and the availability and all that? Yeah, so it's a $15 book. And as usual, we offer bundles. Um, of course, you might want to get all the iWork books, the pages, numbers, keynote together. Uh, basically, it's you know the standard take control thing. If you buy three or more titles, you save thirty percent. And uh, we would like you to buy as many titles as you can afford. Um, maybe in a few more than that. Um, but <laughs> this is this is actually the least expensive and the and the and the shortest of the uh, of the iWork books. Um, and uh, available at TakeControlBooks.com. Great. Joe, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it, and I appreciate all your work on Take Control of, of Keynote. I'm looking forward to going through again and learning a little bit more about things that I don't know how to do yet. Awesome. Thanks very much for having me. We'll do it again. Okay. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. That's Joe Kissel. Take Control of Keynote is his latest book at TakeControlBooks.com. We hope to see you right here, uh, right back here on Mac Voices real soon. Thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.